Hello, everybody. Here we are on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day for those of you that are mothers. Of course, in light of reincarnation and karma, we know that we've all been mothers at some point or another, uh, except for those of us maybe got here for the first time. Although I don't think there's a whole lot of those floating around on, on this uh, particular podcast. In any event, today's a, a very special day for everybody, but it has a special place in my heart for my mother who passed back, back in the 80s. And David, Reverend David's mother passed away recently, but from what he says, it was a good passing. And so that's the best thing you can hope for is a good death because there really is no death. So it's unfortunate when somebody has to go through it in a challenging way. But that being said, also yesterday was uh, White Lotus Day, which is the uh, anniversary of the passing of H.P. Uh, Blavatsky, a controversial figure to say the least, but nonetheless, the White Lotus Day is celebrated by all the Theosophical Societies and it's to encourage uh, meditation on the, the lotus metaphor. You know, it's born in the mud and it grows through the water and, and breaks through to the surface, to the air and the light of the sun, right? And also the seeds of the lotus, even before they germinate, uh, they have like this, they look like a lotus. So it's, it's really a, a special image. And Blavatsky, yeah, we, we can get into a, a critique uh, regarding her contributions as she really kind of stumbled when it came to her interpretation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. But I don't think anybody that's really spent any time juggling her just huge corpus, her huge body of work, I don't think anybody that's really done enough time would, would think that she was of ill intent. And so that being said, let's hope that others can, can find inspiration for compassion and understanding when confronted with a daunting figure like HPB. And uh, in fact, in light of that, I'll, I'll share a quote that I posted the other day from Madame Blavatsky herself, who is a von Hahn, descended from the first czars of Russia from that family. But anyways, she says, Whatever plane our consciousness may be acting in, both we and the things belonging to that plane are, for the time being, our only realities. As we rise in the scale of development, we perceive that during the stages through which we have passed, we mistook shadows for realities, and the upward progress of the ego is a series of progressive awakenings each advance bringing with it the idea that now, at last, we've reached reality. But only when we shall have reached the absolute consciousness and blended our own with it, shall we be free from the delusions produced by Maya. And, uh, of course, Maya is a Sanskrit word, which means illusion. And she passed on May 8, 1891. She was born in August 12th, 1831. So she had quite a life. But uh, it brings to mind some, some interesting ideas. And I've been contemplating this all week. And that's part of the pleasure of, of my weekly experiences, trying to figure out what next. And I thought about it and really... Uh, in bringing to mind that whole idea of 
of that which is across the threshold, those that have passed before us, and and what light can we bring across the threshold from here in the world of, of the so-called living. But in the Gospel of Matthew uh, 6.22, Jesus says the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So that's a, a profound saying to say the least, especially when you consider that it's as if it's not as if every word that that uh, Jesus Christ uttered has layers and layers of meaning, and uh, that verse has been variously translated. You know, like some uh, translations, instead of saying single, they say healthy. Like that's the New International and the New Living Translation and the English Standard Version. The, the Berean Study Bible says good, but the Berean Literal Bible says clear. And the Aramaic Bible in plain English, it says, but the lamp of the body is the eye, therefore, if your eye shall be sound, your whole body also will be illuminated. And which is, brings in some other concepts. Of course, the, the word that, that they're translating as light, it's, it's like a lamp or a, an illuminator. The Greek word is uh, luknos. And it's interesting because in, in Luke uh, 2, uh, 34, it says, If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. So there's this whole idea that, that is uh, centered around the illumination. And you find in, in spiritual teachings from all the great traditions that there's a point at which there's this illumination that, that occurs to the advanced souls of that tradition you find it in, in every one of them i've looked all over and it's it's all over the place and you can have that actual experience but the the thing that i want to to to, to share with you today is something that that i hold uh very close to my heart and it's it's interesting when viewed in the light of some indications that rudolf steiner gave and in the esoteric lesson in Berlin on uh, the October 23rd, 1907. And he says that rejection of spiritual wisdom is a sin against the Holy Spirit. And uh, in there, he explains that the archangels uh, period, the, the archangel Gabriel was the regent of the period before the age of Michael began in 1879 in November. Now, in understanding this, when you get into Gabriel, what is he, what is his role in, in the Bible? He's, he's the guy that he comes in and when I say guy, you know, he's the archangel that, that is the one who uh, makes announcements regarding birth and all that. So he's, He's a, a lunar uh, archangel, whereas Michael is solar, and it's important to understand that. We'll get into some of the other archangels some other time, but right now we're focusing on these two. And you see that during that roughly 350-year archangelic period of, of Gabriel, he uh, was an inspiration regarding the whole concept of bloodlines and familial relationships but also secret organizations, uh, secret knowledge, and things of that ilk. And it's important to understand that, that with the beginning of the age of Michael in 1879, they were opening the doors to the Aditum, that the knowledge that was once held by these secret organizations is now open for anybody who wants to spend the time and pursue it. And 
it's important to understand also that uh, when Rudolf Steiner is talking about, let me find the, the reference here. Yeah, that's the long one. How about the shorter one? Yes. Okay. He gives uh, some indications regarding our relationship to the world of, of the dead and that we can be a source of understanding for those that have crossed the threshold and that there's a three-stage process that we can meditatively enter into this. And it's important to keep in mind that the just ordinary thinking that's concerned with sense impressions has no value for, for those that have crossed the threshold. That's a difficult concept to understand, but it's definitely worth pursuing if this is your area of interest. But he gave a cosmic threefold meditation of the, that progresses from thinking to feeling to will. And the first stage of that was a saying that can lead one to, to an experience of your life before you were born. And the, the meditative phrase he gives is, wisdom lives in the light. Now, he, he makes it very clear regarding that statement that there's nothing in your sense experience that's going to validate that for you. And so it's something that's it's free of, of this realm of the senses, and it enables you to be able to gain a transcendental relationship, a transcendental activity within your thinking can provide a, a, a bridge into the, the world of those on the other side of the threshold. And the second stage that he, that he gives that, it has to do with bringing feeling into it. So the first stage is that you, you bring your thoughts into the sense-free realm. The second stage is that you imbue this thought with feeling. And, and the, the verse that he gives for that, for the cosmic feeling, is wisdom radiates in the light. And to visualize in your meditative uh, posture, however you're comfortable in your big easy chair, to, to see that this wisdom is actually radiating you with light and is giving you this whole feeling that's imbuing you with warmth, and that that is something that can, just as the first one works on the brow chakra, this can bring you into the, the throat chakra and the mysteries of the word and imbuing your speech with that force, that, that God force of love. When he brings us to the third stage, he says, now, to bring in the will, it's, it's important to come to an understanding of the will's relationship to the blood itself, and that the blood, in the actual pulsations of the blood, and then, like, if you become uh, flush, or if you become chill because of, it, of, of something that that's, makes you fearful, you could see that that's, that's the will working within your blood. And so... If you could take this, this awareness of, of that particular process and bring it into this formulation, the wisdom of the world radiates in the light. Now, the first stage will bring you, if wisdom lives in the light, to the experience of life before birth. The second stage wisdom radiates in the light, imbued with feeling, brings you to an experience of previous incarnation. And the third stage, wisdom of the world radiates in the light, can bring you to a, an experience of the pre-earthly stages of, of uh, the chain of earth evolution, 
of which were in the fourth that I've made reference to a great many times. And that this can provide a means where you can develop yourself towards being able to be uh, an instructor, so to speak. Because, see, many people think when they, oh, when I die, then I'll know all this stuff. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you, don't get a, you don't get a free ticket when you cross, cross the threshold. It's the time that you spent in developing your relationship to the supersensible realm that provides you with a capacity to understand the experience that you have and the beings that you meet. And the more time you spend on it, the, the more clarity you'll gain until eventually the, the culmination of, of this threefold process is that like an initiate being able to, to leave your body and be fully conscious outside of your body. And that's something that's possessed by great initiates and so forth. But in that regard, coming to these uh, deepening states it, it can bring you into this relationship, and there's a great gift that you can give for those that have passed across the threshold because the time that you spend contemplating spiritual science and even reading aloud yeah, to, uh, or just reading and, and with them in mind, you're providing a, a nurturing food for those souls that are across the threshold, like many of our dear mothers. And so that's uh, a wonderful gift that we can give to the world. I just wanted to share that on Mother's Day and in memory of my mother and David's mother, that they may be blessed with, with this uh, offering that we share today. Reverend David, how are you? Reverend David in the great city of London in merry old England, and I'm here in Detroit in the the police state of Michigan at the current time. <laughs> but, but we don't want to go there today. Let's let's do the good stuff. Uh, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, every mother in the world. Um, my sympathies, my condolences for your mother, my happy memories of my own. Um, yes, it's a wonderful vocation to be a mother. Whether or not we've done it before uh, in this or any other life, it's a wonderful thing. Um, my own mother, as you said, passed very peacefully in a way that she wanted. So today is sort of a double-edged thing um, because she couldn't have gone in a better way, uh, in you know, in her own terms. And we've all got to go. So it's good to go that way. Um, I haven't quite got over your Doctor Strange amulet around your throat at the moment, which is uh, wonderful. I wonder if you're going to, is something going to float. Didn't he use that to float into the air or something? Um, and in his cloak, it was some sort of cloak of levitation. So I'm deeply impressed with that and feeling I'm terribly underdressed for this show. Um, yeah, I'm feeling in a half jocular mood. I, I confess that because, of course, we had the results of the mayor of London election yesterday. Uh, my own candidate was Count uh, Binface, um, who was the only man truly qualified for the job, as he said himself. Um, he was robbed at the last minute by the fascists and communists that battle to control this city. Count Binface, we love you. Don't go anywhere. Your time is coming. Um, but the trouble is, the time is coming for London already. That old fraud, Sadiq Khan, won again. Hey, never underrate the power of demographics or block voting. <clears throat> or the fact every single Muslim in the city, with one or two rather sensible exceptions, probably voted in that direction. Um, so it's not about skill. It's not about humanitarian concern. It's not about intelligence. It's about race, pure and simple, which is why this uh, this city of London is falling to bits. Yes, I did say race, not ethnicity, because I won't clothe it in a, in the type of uh, clothing. I won't clothe it in the, in the way it wants to be, the quaffer that it wants to be. This is racism. Um, <laughs> Are the other parties guilty of that? Of course they are. But I'm working on the principle that, you know, they're all in the wrong for doing that. Not that Sadiq Khan is particularly in the wrong. 
Um, I've no time for the man whatsoever. He is a fraud. Um, but then we get I mean, the funny thing, I suppose, is uh, the Labour Party is in yet another crisis. Um, I, I don't quite know. When, when do they ever get out of a crisis? Um, uh, as people who watch this show know, I'm an old libertarian. I'm hoping for a happier day when people use their rationality to make political decisions um, as opposed to their viscera of various forms or, or their sort of greed. Um, it must come about, otherwise we're all screwed, as they say. Um, so, yeah, so we're back in very familiar territory. Uh, the lefties have been saying things like London is the last bastion of anti-fascism. Can't see it myself because that's how Sadiq Khan rules the city. Um, and the righties are abominable. Um, there are now memes going around with Boris Johnson dressed like a Roman emperor or one of the Arthurian knights holding a Union Jack behind him, telling the French to bog off. Um, sadly, there isn't the slightest shred of irony or, or joke in that. It's a serious meme going around. Um, I was against the collapse of the common, uh, God, common market, that dates me, of the European Union. Um, my view is you have to be at the table to have a good row. If you're not at the table, don't think you can have a good row at a distance. You can't. They're all ignoring us now because we're not at the table. Um, therefore, there's already trouble about contested waters off Jersey for fishing rights. Won't this country ever grow up? Unfortunately, the answer is probably no. Anyway, moving rapidly on, Count Binface. Um mysticism and alacrity yet yeah, uh, i rather have a soft spot for madame blavatsky far from a perfect person but hey who is um very much a creature of her time um uh, the theosophical society as a universalist society do we really want to be without it i'd say no as churches are now carving up their territories once again and everybody's against everybody once again so I can't really see the kingdom coming in through that. Sorry. I can't really see the promises of the gospel in that way. You know, my church is right. You're going to hell. No, 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 no. Uh, this is plainly ridiculous. And how about the other church down the road? They think the same about you. So, no, it won't work at all. Uh, you know, it's better that the Theosophical Society is there than not. It's reassuring that, that, you know, any society, no matter how imperfectly, it lives up to its own motto. You know, there's no religion higher than truth. Um, needs to be applauded. Um, is the current type of globalism desirable? No, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every form of globalism isn't unde is undesirable. We, you know, we've got to be quite careful of that. Um, and one day, hopefully, we can all at least talk. Wouldn't that be a wonderful world? Um, in terms of angels, uh, medieval angelology is not one of my strongest points. Although I will say, um, actually, I can see why Aquinas was getting, the ox of learning was getting hot and bothered by how many angels can you get on the end of a pen? Because, of course, actually, what they're doing is talking about concepts such as non-spatial being, um, which, of course, is incredibly modern and advanced. Um, in terms of angels, I mean, certainly from an esoteric angle, you could say that, you know, uh, the archangel Gabriel is actually Hermes, Hermes, as they used to say, you know, the messenger of the gods, the messenger of higher powers, the messenger of that which points towards the eternal. Um, so certainly there's some sort of perennialism at work in all of that. Reading St. Augustine's Confessions, there's a clear perennialist theme stream in a great many parts of it um, that isn't to be pushed away. I mean, the present need of certain types of Protestant to say that it can't possibly mean what it means because that sounds like Hinduism or that sounds like Buddhism is religious childishness compared to the political childishness we were looking at before. So you're not learning from the angels, you're telling them their business. Um, if thine eye be single, thy body will be full of light, can't possibly be true, because um, our, 
because it sounds like the new age or it sounds like hinduism oh my god jesus christ said it what do we do now panic 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 it must mean something else no different layers of meaning you're far too generous john they're stupid bastards that's what it comes down to it's in scripture it's very clear it's a mystical statement yes it sounds like certain types of hindu and buddhist teaching maybe that's not bad um certainly i mean i remember a hoo-ha years back at the theosophical society where i used to hang out um it was yet another of those legendary quests for the truth that sort of fell fell into warring factions yet again um where the the word om the divine word om came up in this meeting and somebody was digging in their heels saying well if it's so important why didn't jesus say it and then somebody started quoting evans wentz saying but ah in those days he would have said amen instead of amen amen was <laughs> actually said said amen in those days then this went on for hours and you think god i've got to have a coffee um so but of course they, they're right that's true that would have been the case um what i see are the footprints and the the footprints and the fingerprints of the divine i don't see contradictions i don't see darkness i don't see the, the the trickery of demons why because it's leading towards the realms of light if anything's leading you towards the realms of light de facto it is from the realms of light um oh my god we're talking about luciferianism no we're not because that's the false light not the true light um i remember i said you've got me full of anecdotes today i'll do i'll give you one more then shut up you know i remember giving a, a lecture myself years ago i can't remember what it was on the fairy faith since we've spoken about evans Wentz, and this incredibly posh woman turned up after i'd been talking about the dead the power of the dead for about 10 minutes and look at i mean she looked a bit like marlena dietrich which was putting me off you know if ever there was a demi goddess amongst actors and singers it's marlena dietrich um so i went to her at the end and i said oh, i'm so sorry for being so maudlin i mean you know they had to come up because it was in the the, the fabric of my speech to which she said oh but the dead are so cool and i never recovered from that one either um why i suppose because she had in mind the other part of my lecture which was talking about their enlightenment the light which never the light which passeth all understanding you're bringing out the gnostic bit in me today john you know the light is the eternal effulgence of the absolute um it is calling us all it's beckoning us all i completely agree with you you've got to make a relationship with it you don't suddenly land on all fours on the other side and know everything wouldn't that be great but no so we we carve out our relationship with it we 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 work with it in an organic and super sensible way i completely agree with you on that excuse me i've got a runny nose today because pollen is in the air so i i i, I used to get hay fever many years ago i didn't have it when i first moved to london for years but the air quality now is so bad the slightest pollen in the air and i'm snorting like an elk so everybody's got to forgive me as i missed a snort as a rev snort not mr reverend snorty today yes i went i'll embrace um yeah i mean i i personally think these esoteric i mean what's wrong with the new age per se um you know it's always said by people with an axe to grind and normally the axe isn't that pleasant the minute you start looking at it and you know what's wrong with people finding other ways towards the light if that's the best they can do at that particular time you know you are wrong burn in hell no no you know if that's your attitude maybe you're the person that's in the wrong um what was it i can't remember i can't remember which saint who said it offhand you know theology without love saint maximus theology without love is the theology of the demons um and that i think is as true then as it is now and we've got to remember that and are, are you representing that you're doing their best to find the light personally i think not handing you back handing it back john well that's interesting when you said that you're you're your, the soundtrack for your voice started to wobble. I think you pissed off 
pissed off the demons. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I I mean, I go back to Goethe as I so frequently do, and he's one of the people that uh, I almost always agree with. You know, and that's pretty rare thing because, uh, like I say, I don't endorse people because if they change their mind and start going down a path that I don't agree with, then it's uh, by association, uh, by endorsing them, I've endorsed that point of view, and uh, which frequently happens with uh, dear friends of ours and of mine and so forth. That uh, Just when I think everything's hunky-dory, then all of a sudden, there's a fly in my soup. <laughs> but uh, I go back to again to the, the letter uh, to Sulpiz Boisere that uh, Goethe wrote in, in March 22nd of 1831. And uh, Goethe says, I have found no confession of faith to which I could ally myself without reservation. Now, in my old age, however, I have learned of a sect, the Hypsisterians, who hemmed in between heathens, Jews, and Christians, declared that they would treasure, admire, and honor the best, the most perfect that might come to their knowledge, and inasmuch as it must have a close connection to the Godhead, pay it reverence. A joyous light thus beamed at me suddenly out of a dark age. For I had the feeling that all of my life I'd been aspiring to qualify as a hypsisterian. That, however, is no small task. For how does one, in the limitations of one's individuality, come to know what is most excellent? End quote. Well, that sums it up for me. I mean, really, uh, in looking at these things, uh, of course, uh, Jesus Christ is a far better way of putting it. But then, you know, he's he's in charge. What does he say? He says, I have other flocks. Okay. I never hear any anybody uh, of any particular congregation making reference to that one remark. That's the one that they seem to... to ignore and it's always fun to ask them when confronted by one of these people of, of any confession whatsoever what did he mean by that <laughs> and uh, see what they come up with because it, it tends to make them wobble a little bit because that's that's a that's a tough one but uh in getting into this uh it's interesting that that we we frequently spoken uh, about the the progression of the Old Testament and how it comes to a great uh, ending on it. And towards the end, you get the the seven sons of the Maccabee and and the five sons of Mattathias, Judas and his brothers, and it's interesting. Because that that's a twelve-fold mystery right there. So that there's near, right near the end of the of the, the uh, Old Testament that that twelve-fold mystery, that cosmic mystery is is presented to, directly to one's uh, challenge, really, because the Bible is continually challenging you to come to try and understand. And and it's interesting because Rudolf Steiner said. And I quote, for, it's from the Gospel of St. Mark uh, lecture cycle in Basel on September 16th, 1912. He says, the gaze of Christ Jesus could rest upon the 12, the reincarnated souls of those who had been the seven sons of the Maccabean and the five sons of Mattathias, Judas, and his brothers. It was of these that the apostolate was formed. So you see the 
quite a profound revelation in light of reincarnation and karma. Uh, that that's the perspective that, that, that was Rudolf Steiner's mission to add. And somebody keeps asking, you know, when are we going to talk about karma? Well, that's all we talk about. <laughs> but that being said, uh, in trying to get to this, you see where last week I discussed about how he gave the indication that the Old Testament prophets were reincarnated initiates from other cultures and, and that there's that kind of awkward existence that, that, that they have within it, but yet goes through a progression through the Old Testament culminating in the story of Cyrus the Persian, who was uh, chosen by God. You know, he wasn't uh, a prophet, but he was the best that the uh, local area had to offer to accomplish what needed to be done. And in a way, you could see Blavatsky like that. She's she's carrying these these treasured urns from the ancient world. That doesn't mean she understands all of it. Okay, she understood way more than most of the people that I've met. But as far as as, as her understanding of Old Testament and New Testament, she's uh, quite lacking because she had a particular perspective on it, and eventually, she went wholeheartedly into the Eastern Lodge, so to speak, and under the tutelage of of her her two primary teachers that were both Sikhs. So uh, God bless her and her, that's her path, you know, and that's fine. And, but because you see, when you get into the Sikhs, what's their, what's their central mystery? It's the mystery of the word. Well, guess what? What is, what is uh, Jesus Christ say? I mean, in the first 14 verses uh, of the gospel of John, in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's straight out laid on the sacred table right there before you, is that the mystery, which is considered in, in occult science the sixth mystery, which is a recapitulation of the mystery of number and relates to the old sun existence. And and you see Rudolf Steiner's indications that that. Uh, the Christ was the leader of the sun spirits in old sun evolution. And when you get into understanding earth evolution, and he describes about how in the early stages of earth evolution, the, 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 the earth and the sun and the moon were all together as one body. And then the sun separated from the earth, taking the, the higher spirits with it, the leader of those spirits, is the Christ. And then later on, the moon separated from the earth. And the leader of the spirits on the moon is Jehovah Elohim, who is directly connected together with the mission of Christ, Jehovah, and Michael, who is the countenance of Jehovah in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the countenance of Christ. And that, that, and that the Archangel Michael, who is now elevated to the next stage beyond that as, as the time spirit, the Archai, that he is the, the uh, leader of the company of the seven primary archangels being that he is the archangel of the sun. And just as the sun is to the planets, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that the sun appears to be far more profound than say like Mercury or Venus, although they, they are to be respected in that they are what they are. Nonetheless, the leader in, in the, the messenger of light is my God. And so in coming to the mysteries of Michael, he represents that light. And what is that light? That light comes from higher beings of the realm of the Elohim, of the Exusiae, 
that are the highest beings that can actually interact within space and time. So that it's extremely profound mystery where you have the, the leader of the sun spirits. I am the I am proclaiming it. And then you have that culmination in the New Testament with the baptism where the Christ spirit entered into Jesus of Nazareth. And you have the only being from the upper spiritual world to actually come into a physical incarnation as a human being to create the archetype for our future evolution, see? And so I'm sure I lost a lot of people on, on saying a lot of those things because they can't deal with it. They have their sense-bound thinking, whatever, their, their approach to the world, and they have the freedom to do that. That's the way it is here. It's Christ is a mystery that one has to come to of their own free will and accord. But it's challenging because in secret groups, you take the symbols of the mysteries and they twist them around and, and, and use them for their own purposes. And so you see a lot of the presentations regarding the mysteries are terribly distorted, like the the one that, that Greg Reese did on the Illuminati the other day. It's like, it's just ridiculous because the, the mysteries are not the source of the problems. It's what certain people have done to pervert the mysteries that is the problem, Greg. And so I don't know if you'll see this. He, he probably thinks I'm some kind of hobgoblin at this point if he's listened to any of my things. But uh, then again, you know, he thinks that uh, the Old Testament, uh, that Jehovah came out of a UFO. So, you know, okay, good luck with that. Uh, I, I imagine that uh, you could you could interpret the, the, like the, the, the wheels of Ezekiel well, it's unidentified, and it is flying, so it's a it's an unidentified flying object, so so to speak. But to, to to have to have to relegate everything to to space guys and 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 uh, these uh, little dish uh, saucer craft is is a bit much. But uh, that's as far as some people can go because they're they're. Trying to solve this with the abstract thinking, and abstract thinking is in the realm of fear, and and we'll get it further into that at some point. David raised his finger, and so teacher says, "Okay." I'm not sure I see myself in that way. Um, let me do the protocols before you. You, you it's your fault today, John Barnwell. You, you're triggering a sense of humor. It's your fault today. Um, my friends in Shakespeare and Company, I never forget you. I never forget you, John, and I never forget you. We love you, we love you, we love you. We're still waiting for our invite. Um, oh, I mean, right, where do I start about UFOs? I saw one, so I know they exist. <clears throat> Excuse me, I saw one many years ago when I was at secondary school in Fareham in Hampshire, a small market town uh, uh, towards the south of England. We were kids in a playground, and... Um, a silvery disc of a classic sort. Everybody in the playground saw it. Started hovering silently above the playground. So I know they exist. And um, that doesn't mean I know what they are. That's, that's different. Um, I remember it being beautiful. I remember the effect it had on everybody. Some kids ran off screaming. There are always... You know, some kids just ignored it. They obviously all became politicians and stood for the mayoral elections of London. Um, us more robust types went in to the teacher's tea room, which you never, ever did, and said, there's a UFO. What, no, hang on. There was a, there's a flying saucer over the playground, and we were told to get out because it was their tea break. Um, so we all watched it float off. Um, by the way, I didn't realise in those days it was near a major uh, naval base, but I'm not saying anything. Yet, but all I'm saying is it was near a very important naval base. Okay. Um, so we went back into class afterwards, and the first thing the teacher said was, and nobody's going to talk about UFOs. 
So I stopped believing in formal mainstream education that day. Um, you know, I, I went into self-reading and self-education after that because she was clearly talking rubbish and didn't want to see a little miracle. So what do you know, love, about anything? Um, I, oh, God, no, I'm, I've got a foot in that camp somewhere. I love all that. You know, E.T. coming to Earth and, you know, the opening of the two, 2001 of Space Odyssey with that wonderful atmospheric music and men hears and and monkeys throwing bones at each other. No, I, there's, a, there's a part of me that loves all that. Um, what I will say is, I don't know, because there's an esoteric element to all of these interpretations. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, is there? Um, UFO conferences, right? I have got a confession to make. I haven't ever been to a proper UFO conference. I'm probably blackballed. I went to one, uh, the, the, a sort of proto proto UFO conference in Glastonbury, the very holy hub of this country many years ago. And I'm sorry, couldn't resist. I asked someone if they had a crystal skull. They didn't see the gag. I asked somebody else if UFOs came from Uranus. They didn't get that gag either. So, but, and I thought if everyone around here is so deadly serious, this isn't for me. Maybe they don't know what they're talking about. Who knows? Um, yeah, if you look at the type of literatures that upset people like Alice Bailey and Blavatsky, um, they talk about an interplanetary continuum with life streaming between different worlds that we recognize on various levels. It's all already in there. Um, you know, the fact that the hierarchy in Alice Bailey's writings are actually from Venus. They're not from Earth. Um, and But not on physical Venus as we know it, on a higher vibrational density uh, of Venus. They came to this retarded world at the beginning of time. I think they give a figure to that, curiously, uh, to give it a bit of a kickstart, which I think it still needs, to be honest. Um, and what is their technology? Their, te their technology would, would be what we call the occult. Um, so it is there. I mean, I remember something else in literary circles. Um, Adamski had been outed. When was that man ever in? He was outed all the time. Um, somebody said on a, a very famous American TV program, you know, one of those interviews, that actually he'd seen Blav uh, Blavatsky. There's a Freudian slip. He'd seen Adamski's book before it was published as a novel and therefore his interpretation of that was oh it must be a novel and he's a failed novelist which is why he's saying actually that wasn't my interpretation of that you take that back a, a further step maybe he was always saying what he was saying about those experiences if they occurred but he was saying it in a novel form. I mean, you know, how do you approach a reading public? Yes, we've all got to, to earn a living. We've all got to eat. How do you approach the modern public? You probably do it best through a novel. I mean, that's why I'm constantly flirting with a novel. You know, um, The Exorcist, I mean, let's face it, came out as a novel because, what was it, Blatty? I, I can never remember the name of the, the author. Blatty felt that was the best way of getting that message out and discussing those things and making a bob or two at the same time. So, and of course, it's based on real paranormal materials. In fact, one of my friends knew one of the exorcists involved in that case, or the, the um, I can't remember how it worked, or the teacher or the student of, I can't remember. I will ask for next week if anybody's interested. So I have an indirect link with those worry worrisome events. Um, I'll tell you one thing that did catch my attention on that. And then I'll, I'll start shutting up a bit. Um, on to, in to, right, uh, I read a, one of those trash books on on the tra on the on trains. I used to read trash books to see what popular culture, whatever. If there was an oxymoron, it's popular culture. Um, what they were saying, but it, one thing caught my attention. Someone had given me a UFO book since they're determined to drag me into that realm, kicking or screaming one day. I don't know who knows. Um, and it was odd, I confess, but it was odd because of things I'd read elsewhere that the person who gifted me the book can't possibly have known. Um, they, uh, there was someone called Desmond Leslie who was getting involved in the whole Adamski phenomena. Actually, I don't want to poo-poo it. I don't want to rain on its parade. Something was going on. 
Um, and this guy in the book was caught up into a UFO, a beam ship. Um, and on the UFO, inside the UFO, was a kid uh, wearing a, a robe, a blue robe with a huge red rose across the heart. Ah ha ha, we're back in familiar territory. We're dealing with Rosicrucian mysteries. And the kid kept addressing itself as Yamsky and kept saying there's someone called Des Les, Desmond Leslie, who needs to be told everything is working, working well, working appropriately. I'm paraphrasing massively. And they, the guy that wrote the book hadn't even heard of Desmond Leslie at that time and met him down the road a bit, who was, as you would, as you would be, yeah, you know, as you would think, was gobsmacked by the whole thing. Um, so you're looking at different vibrational rates of planets that we all know. You're looking at uh, an, you know, a stream of, of interplanetary cultures already there and interplanetary impulses, which is quite an amazing thought. It's already there or it's not there. When the UFO people are waiting for it to be established, you know, is it, is it just a, a fact of life? I mean, somebody asked me, I never talk about these things. Somebody asked me what I thought of it all years ago, and I'm going to confess on this program, I see those footsteps everywhere, those glittering footsteps everywhere. Um, that doesn't mean I understand them or I suddenly want to go onto the top of a mountain and wait for a, a mothership to suddenly turn up. That's not what it means. It means I'm aware of the karma and the continuum that we live in. We live in a continuum with various levels of life streaming between different worlds. We live in a universe of light and communication. Um, the arrogance is when you think you're on top of it and you know it's talking to you and nobody else, and that's arrogance. I'm sympathetic to the UFO mob. I certainly don't think the wheel within wheels is talking about a machine. Um, I mean, the, the great poets have actually dealt with what it was talking about. And of course, the wheels within wheels are actually on the chariot of Apollo. So you're dealing with, um, and that's not to scare anybody, you're dealing with very deep mystery material, which is to do with the journey of consciousness within. And that we probably need 15 shows. I, you know that as well as I do, John, to even start broaching. I don't know how we do that. Uh, so I, I hear somebody saying we, we don't talk about karma. I have a Zen approach to karma. Um, I don't like talking as a Gnostic. You know, uh, Gnostics have achieved the knowledge. Uh, what is the knowledge? Enlightenment. Uh, are all the people going around calling themselves Gnostics enlightened? No. Uh, but they can call themselves Gnostics in the sense that they're working towards. You know, Zen, you're either there or you're not there. I think the two of the methods of getting there are sort of familiarizing oneself with the strange familiarity of all these ideas we know them somehow we know them they're inside us already and good lessons on karma i mean despite the gags i made about karma on previous shows <clears throat> you know it's it's good to talk about super sensible laws i don't personally think they can be discussed in the way say subatomic physics can be discussed or i know i'm going to upset people by saying this and i don't mean to you know lots of people want to talk about quantum mechanics and they want to talk about things like karma and the higher worlds in, on, in that way maybe it can be done but i've not really heard anything convincing yet um, because these things are bound to particular types of discourse with a, a, a series of identified assumptions behind them they're not just words popping into the ether out the blue you know they've got a history they've got an evolution they, they they're designed to interrelate to other concepts uh, having said that, it is not impossible, which is why I would tend to defend certain aspects of Alice Bailey and Blavatsky. What they were trying to do was use these concepts, impossibly complex concepts, um, with, you know, with an attitude that was like the naturalistic sciences from the West. Um, not always convincing, but very brave. Uh, and particularly because, of course, if there are two basic types of karma, positive and negative, it's not all negative. Do you have to be karma free to reach enlightenment? Yes, you do. Will that ever happen? No, it won't. So there must be that magical moment that sets you karma free. And that is, of course, when we're dealing with higher beings, higher intelligences, and the promises made in the holy books, I'll hand that back. 
UFO people, good. I promise I'll behave if I ever go to another UFO conference. Am I one of you in disguise? I don't know. Uh, I do know UFOs exist, and maybe that would be a good thing to talk about at some point. John, the floor is yours. <laughs> so I'm on the floor now, eh? Yeah, well, you know, I remember I, I told this story before, but I think it was quite a few episodes back, but because uh, we haven't talked to, brought up UFOs in a long time. But uh, yeah, I was having a conversation with Douglas Gabriel from American Intelligence Media, my best friend. And we broached the subject of UFOs. And the next day he calls me up. He says, you know, I had that conversation with you about UFOs. And, and uh, I go out of my backyard and, and this cigar-shaped UFO materialized up above my backyard and then started to fly away and dematerialized again. So, yeah, the, the, there's a, a lot going on out there. And personally, I think most of the craft that, that people see uh, are craft of the U.S. government and a few other governments that they've been screwing around with those types of technology for a long, long time. And any technology you know about is uh, just way behind the times. I mean, geez, if you look at the at the scenario, you'd think they hadn't invented anything since the late 40s. You know, <laughs> they're so secretive about everything. But that being said, uh, getting it back into the, the mothers is an interesting concept because you you get into uh, in Faust in the in the second part of Faust, Goethe gets into talking about the realm of the mothers, and uh, Rudolf Steiner indicates that that was something that had really entered strongly into Goethe's uh, consciousness as a result of readings he did in uh, Plutarch. And Plutarch is a, a fascinating uh, individual. And in understanding Plutarch, you can get to some ideas that are quite surprising uh, when you find them there, because if you didn't know it already, you wouldn't notice that that it was there. So it's, it's very deep stuff, and that Plutarch was from a wealthy family, and uh, but he was a, a, a priest at, at the Temple of Apollo, see, and, and, and it's, it's interesting because Rudolf Steiner is the only one I know that's really deciphered. I, I, Blavatsky may have made, made mention of it. I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked it up there. But I, uh, Rudolf Steiner makes the point of that, that in Plutarch, I have to find the reference again here. <clears throat> uh, where is it? Yeah. Uh, he says, we find mention in Plutarch of how the world has a triangular form. Now, naturally, these words, the world has a triangular form, must not be taken in a heavy literal sense, for the spatial is but a symbol of what is neither time nor space. Since we live in space, Spatial images must be used for what is nevertheless beyond image, time, or space. Thus, Plutarch gives a picture of a triangular world. This is the whole world, and he has a diagram, and it's the eye in the triangle. Okay? <laughs> and so, and he says, uh, this is the whole world. According to Plutarch, in the center of the tr this triangle, that is the world, the field of truth is found. So that's the idea of that the uh, third eye, right? But out of this whole world, Plutarch differentiates 183 worlds. And, but you see, classical scholars will just, they blow right past that one. They don't even really get into trying to understand what this means. Uh, and, but that this is the imagination for the mothers, right? and you have the number 183 given by him. But you see, if you go through that whole sequence and, and you add up the, the stages, 
uh, of uh, planetary chain and then you get into the, the different uh, periods so you have the the we're in the fourth world and then you have the polarian period the hyperborean period the lemurian period the atlantean period now this is the post-atlantean period that's the fifth in all there's seven but we're in the fifth period and then but but see plutarch was in the fourth period so but if you add all all of that up all the various stages that are involved then you get to that that number that he gives of uh 183 which is really interesting in saying that this is something that that is hinted at that he knew now and and when blavatsky wrote the secret doctrine mind you rudolf steiner said that in reference to the uh lodges in england he said well they knew more about the subject than she did so this is not like something that was just made up like like uh, a very respected scholar, uh, David Feidler, an old friend of mine, who uh, published a lot of very interesting stuff. Uh, nonetheless, I asked him what he thought of Rudolf Steiner, and he said confabulation. And I thought that, that's that's the tragedy, is is that people have their their frame of reference, and they 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 work in a closed system. And he obviously hadn't entered into either Blavatsky or Rudolf Steiner deep enough to understand. And if you don't understand the, the scheme uh, of 777, which David uses as his handle there, but that's 777 is seven times seven times seven, which is 343, which is the number of uh, stages within a complete uh, seven-fold scheme going all the way from old Saturn all the way up to the Vulcan period. So there's 343 embodiments in a planetary chain. So that's what that means. And so this is what uh, Plutarch is referencing here with the 183 worlds, because he was in the fourth post-Atlantean period, where you'd add all the stages that led up to that point. He would be at the 183rd stage of of that whole schemata of 343 which blavatsky makes uh, extensive reference to in the secret doctrine and like i said there's only three primary texts regarding that schemata uh, that's rudolf steiner's outline of occult science or outline of esoteric sciences now it's published or blavatsky's secret doctrine or then there's the uh, C.G. Harrison, uh, his Transcendental Universe. Of course, there's the Mahatma letters, but those were written as letters, so that could be kind of included as they're the inspirers of, of Blavatsky for writing the Secret Doctrine. So that's kind of like uh, an antechamber of the Secret Doctrine is the Mahatma letters, which are very interesting, but they're from that Eastern perspective. And that's the challenging subject I want to get to at some point. So I'm going to make a mental note, mental note uh, regarding that because uh, it's very important to be able to uh, make the distinction between what is the East, the mysteries of the East, and what is the mysteries of the West. And what did I mean when I said to the Dalai Lama's cousin, my old friend, Gaelic Rinpoche, when I told him, well, you know, Buddha's a Christian now. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he he actually always was but uh unless you have uh the underlying esoteric key to understanding the way this whole schemata works uh then you're in your little uh, belief system bubble and uh of course i don't expect anybody to to believe me, necessarily agree with me, but at least try to understand what I think I mean. And if, if you can't do that, then, well, why are you here? <laughs> Sadic vacuum objects. I'm, I'm not sure what he's talking about there. Yeah, well, in getting back to the UFO thing, I, I haven't told this story in a long time, but uh, one of the, the stories that I tell frequently is about my great-grandfather dying and Father Solanus visiting him and he comes back and he, and he was looking forward to dying because he, he enjoyed himself 
on the other side after we've been there and this all happened at his wake and we know that story. But the other earliest story, and actually this is an earlier story in a way in my personal biography, but I was too young at the time to be able to tell the story from my own experience uh, and memory because it was before I had developed my personal memory, which, which occurs around three, three and a half years of age. But I was lying in the crib and it was, uh, I was a baby, and my mother was uh, working on an ironing board, and she was repotting a plant. You know? and so she had the window open, and it was nice spring day and, and, and all of that. And, and she looked out the window. We lived near City Airport at the time, and there was this just very clear, it was a totally clear day. There's this UFO just like parked above City Airport. And she looked at it and, she, and there wasn't anybody she could say anything to. When I was a baby in a crib, she could say, hey, look at this. <laughs> you know? But then after she saw that, a lightning bolt or an energy bolt of some sort burst through the window and, and knocked a potted plant off the ironing board. And it just totally startled her. And, but then she looked over at me to see if I was okay, and I just started cracking up. I thought it was the funniest thing. So I don't know, maybe, maybe that's how I got here. I, don't, I have no idea. But I, I heard a story that, that uh, a similar thing had happened to St. Thomas Aquinas. A lightning bolt came in and killed his sister. Uh, in the crib, and uh, that's kind of a, a strange uh, thing to happen, and you wonder what that means, and uh, maybe she was accompanying him throughout his life as, as like kind of a, a tutelary spirit of some sort. You know? it's a, we don't know. That, that's just a speculation that uh, I've thought about. I don't think I've ever discussed it with anybody, but in any event, there's always more than meets the eye. And that's, that's the point we're trying to get at. And, and if you've closed your mind, then you're going to have difficulty in getting to the point to where you start having your eye uh, find more through, through providing more light. If therefore thine eye be single, thy body shall be filled with God's light. Well, what does that mean? That means that as we are expanding our consciousness, we can get to the point to where in our thinking we gain clarity and then we move down and we're able to surround that with warmth of feeling that gives us uh, an entry into the power of the logos, the power of the word, and to be able to bring that down into the realm of the heart and, and connect it to those heart forces bringing it into the realm of the will, then we're starting to enter into a relationship in the most intimate way. Because with the first stage uh, of the thinking, it brings you into an awareness of life before birth. The second stage in the throat can bring you into an awareness of previous incarnations. And the third stage of the will can bring you into a relationship of perceiving the uh, previous evolution stages, this whole septenary chain that this came out of uh, experience. And Rudolf Steiner is very clear, but he says that the, the gift that spiritual science has to bring is that in spiritual science is formulated a way that anybody can understand given the, the capacity to understand most anything, they should be able to sort through this if they have the patience of the inclination. And although they, they may not have the, the capacities to be able to perceive these things, uh, they can come to an understanding of these things and that gives them value so that when they make their journey across the threshold, that they'll have these concepts to work with and, and 
like Rudolf Steiner had once said that this is this is a Christ language when you get into talking about old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, and uh, future Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. That these are 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 things that that provide us with keys that we need to be able to understand our place within evolution as a whole. And this whole uh, materialistic scenario, the Big Bang, and all these uh, me mechanistic uh, thought processes that they try to, to, to encase us in, that is an illusion. That, that's not really what happened, you know. And so when they, he says, when they get into describing earlier stages of Earth evolution, it's it's interesting. He says because it's like to describe what a child's stomach looked like a couple hundred years ago, when the child didn't even exist. See, so they try to to calculate and, and go back, and therefore, and they are assuming that this was an entirely material process that, that evolved out of entirely material events and, and the the process of, of uh, cosmic evolution the cosmogenesis that's provided by madame blavatsky in the secret doctrine and further clarified by rudolf steiner is uh, uh neither one side or the other with the argument that that happens between uh the the science side of things and the and the scripturalists that both of them don't have it correct according to occult science. That there's that there is a, an evolution, but it's not the way it's described by Darwin and his, and Haeckel and and all those characters. That's a kind of an aramonic image of uh, the metamorphosis. And the principles of metamorphosis, of course, are based in in Gertian science. You caught me that time. Um, oh, gosh, where do I start with all that? Um, I think the perspective of the mothers is incredibly important. Of course, it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau in Emile, um, a novel I haven't read for years, but my, my, my better half read it recently, it says very clearly education should be left to mothers. Um, and it shouldn't be the property of the state, which he had a problematic relationship with. And it shouldn't be left to people who don't really want to do it. Um, you know, if ever there were wise words, I think it's that. Um, and that's why we end up with such bland and de-energizing forms of education. I mean, certainly I tend to not see it as an either or. Um, at the end of the day, Darwin was a Unitarian. Um, and certainly one of his uncles, I can't remember who offhand, used to read Origin of Species from the pulpit, saying it was it was a help to understand what was going on. I mean, there's a famous anecdote uh, from Dar the Darwins of Posh, the Darwins of Posh, where sort of uh, the, the nursery of their particular uh, family, I can't remember what bit of the family, sorry, I'll have to look it up. Uh, a, a dispute breaks out in the playpen um, where sort of, you know, is it evolution as they think Darwin mentioned it? Or is it creation, which actually wasn't what modern creationists mean if you look at what the variant was back then? Um, and the nurse very wisely said, um, and it's written down somewhere, so forgive me, it's in one of the biographies. Uh, Genesis says it took six days. Uncle Charles said it took a little longer but it's a miracle either way and you know if ever they were wise it shows education should be left to women that proves it um you know yeah and hegel of course as a lutheran mystic um that is a, a legitimate way of looking at his work um i i yeah i tend to struggle with either ors um you know uh, have we made our decision for christ uh, if the answers may be, that means you haven't. If the answers no, it means you're missing something. If you have, that doesn't mean closing down your mental apparatus and never thinking again. It doesn't mean judging everybody as condemned apart from you and your little mob. It means the beginning of a, the most challenging 
and vitalizing journey in it, that it's possible for a human being to undertake. To make your decision for Christ means that you've opened up to these types of discourse and you're looking for light. You're looking for higher consciousness. You're looking for the kingdom. You're looking for the keys. You're looking for the angels and you want to meet them. You want to talk to them. You, your faith is strong and you want it to get even stronger through the Christ principle itself. It does not mean a closing down of things. It means an opening. It means a, a clarification. Um, I'm not even against sort of, I'm against the materialism of the scientists because you end up with a denuded picture of reality. In certain ways, it's more accurate. Mathematically, it tends to be more accurate. The only trouble is you've left out most of the things that are important in that process. And if you start adding the subjective things, you know, it's perfectly legitimate to see all of the scriptures, all of the mystical writings as a subjective view, a subjective description of material processes. You know, why would they exist even in a materialistic frame of reference if they if nothing was going on? Therefore, you're looking at the very least at a subjective exploration of those material forces and those material realities you know it's the fact that the scientific elite the high priesthood as they call it tends to be so narrow in its own thinking i mean the big bang strikes me rather like the ingoing and outgoing breath of brahman um in hinduism i don't know why we keep coming back to hinduism nowadays you know uh, the great reality breathes out you get a big bang and material creation starts it breathes in again and the whole thing collapses in the night of pralaya i seem to remember where there's cessation on that level which tends to be one of the primary levels that human beings work on so you know and the fact that the scientific scientific community is itself at the moment beginning to talk about repeated big bangs so it's taken them how long to arrive back at that hum you know that hindu insight um yeah I, i'm worried about either or's because i see it as a sort of an almost you know and also and uh ten uh, you know uh, perspective because i think there is no other enlightening way of looking at it um quantum mechanics you know if we want to explore this a bit more is magic by any other name but as i say we've got to be careful of the transposition of concepts but yes it is and even then the scientific elite closes it down but you know you're you're, you're present human beings are presented with two views of life i think you know either it's this denuded slightly more comforting because it's slightly more secure materialistic view um you know animals in a jungle beating each other up all the time yeah i can i can see that and yes it there's a point to that uh, and that sort of makes certain types of sense or you have a more abstract uh, dare i say or spiritual view uh, whereby it's not as certain and it's not as clear but the narrative is richer and it includes all of the things we want to live for like love truth beauty knowledge knowledge is an abstract concept yeah and all of a sudden it has a place for the blavatsky's for the rudolf steiner's it uh, for the hegel's all of a sudden everyone has a place in that onward pilgrimage from here to the kingdom um i my own wish since it's a sunday even the ufo mob even the ufo mob i mean some of the things i've heard recently some of the things are really dense and i don't mean in terms of vibrations but some of the things i've heard also recently about life streams and sentient string theory i mean that's coming from the ufo community that is incredibly interesting you know they, they must have some very insightful people working within those groups um my my own view is we're all pilgrims homo viator we're we're pilgrims we're wandering humankind we're on a pilgrimage where we start uh, in a given place by by you know given the blessing of being here by our parents by our families by our mothers and we end that journey somewhere else um I just wish the present scientific elite wasn't so dogmatic. Uh, they've got all the worst aspects of religion. You know, they, they're unquestionable doctrines. 
and there are dogmas that, that destroy careers unless you go along with them. I mean, this isn't science. I'm sorry, guys. You know, that's what you call a belief system. Um, and that's OK, but you've got to admit it's a belief system. You know, the impartial searching for truth uh, dedicated and, and, and recommended by the Greeks seems to have gone by the wayside at the minute. But that's a shame because even if everything John and I are saying and everyone that we're quoting is reduced to a, a subjective narrative, commenting on those processes that too has very great value but i suspect we need a proper and, and better educational system than the ones that we've got uh, to actually embark on that let's hear it for the mothers and let the mothers take over by the way you, you sparked an old handbag you sparked a memory my first conscious memory i was sat in my high chair and i was given my first boiled egg and i remember my mother chopping the top off and this little miracle was happening in front of me i could barely believe what was happening and my mother put a spoonful of egg in my mouth but she forgotten there was a bit of shell on the egg i remember spluttering and spitting it out and screaming for as long as i could afterwards how dare she try and try and poison me by whatever this was so you've actually triggered that memory oh why can't i have a gorgeous memory like yours but no, there we are, the existential strength again. And that was part of a spiritual journey too. I'll hand you back, John, I'll hand you back. Yeah. Well, uh, like I said, the the UFO thing, uh, I, that wasn't a personal memory as I was, I hadn't gotten to the threshold of three, three and a half years to where you start to have self-reference. My earliest memory of self-reference was my brother uh, blocking the the window with newspaper because it was glaring on our television. We had one of those old '50s TVs with a the little tiny little screen, you know, and it, they didn't have uh, the kind of uh, frosted type glass that didn't reflect light as much in it. Just the light would come beaming in certain times of the day and you couldn't even see the TV. You'd have to move the whole TV set. And we weren't allowed to do that, so. But I was just a, a little thing. Well, that's great. Yeah, the, uh, we have the good fortune of having with us here the author and uh, a luminary, uh, Reverend David William Perry of London. And uh, he's the author of the Grammar of Witchcraft, which is a Shakespearean study. No, it's not a study of witchcraft. And his Shakespearean as poetry, Caliban's Redemption, which is a wonderful piece. And his masterwork, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg and the Arts, edited by Daniela. Irindus, very talented young fellow. And those are available on Amazon. And uh, so you can find that. There's a link placed uh, below on the, both the Facebook and on the YouTube account. And for myself, as you may already know, my first book is 640 pages, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Duff Steiner of the underground streams that flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, uh, with a foreword by Douglas Gabriel, and it has uh, extensive bibliography and it deals with the the archangelic periods for half of the book and explaining what they mean and, and understanding them as a means for uh, looking at the super sensible destiny of history and the first half of the book is dealing with the fundamental archetypes of uh, the cosmosophy or star wisdom and planetary wisdom as expressed by Rudolf Steiner and bringing him into relationship to many other things as 
And for those of you that don't know, I created a, a, a relational database of occult science and so forth uh, and of thousands of, of volumes for Marjorie Fisher and for her daughter, uh, Marjorie, uh, Dr. Fisher, the Egyptologist, noted Egyptologist, I created a relational database of her library of some, I don't know, 15,000 volumes or so to where you could look up subjects. So I've looked far and wide trying to figure these things out. And uh, uh, many of those insights are included within that first volume. My second volume is The Arcana of Light on the Path, which is more of a meditative tool, and it gives you the kind of thoughts like those meditations I gave you earlier that can provide you with a super sensible bridge into the spiritual world it's based on Mabel Collins' Light on the Path. She was one of the founders of the Theosophical Society with Madame Blavatsky, uh, I think one of the most profound leaders that, that uh, the Theosophical movement had. And, uh, but it's a meditative tool that Rudolf Steiner used when he became head of the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society in uh, Germany. And, uh, but in addition to that, the, in, in both, I have the series of uh, grail diagrams, as I call them, that lead you through all the various aspects of the cosmic mysteries to be able to decipher uh, the mysteries of spiritual science and esoteric Christianity uh, in the Trinitarian uh, school of thought of Dionysius the Areopagite. My books are available on eBay. You can look them up by name and title. Uh, the links don't always work on uh, Facebook and on YouTube because they've kind of uh, made it so they don't work, except by they work on some systems, not others. I don't know all of that. But the link that does work is my academia link, which is below. And you can also, by the way, download uh, for free a PDF of the forward to my second book, the uh, forward by uh, William Bento, who's a noted astrosopher who really passed away a few years back. He was a, a dear soul and, and one of the more profound anthroposophists that I've met. And that being said, if you're outside the U.S., though, uh, you can get a hold of me uh, directly through the academia link below or through a Facebook private message. And you, uh, my books uh, are available, and they'll be less than you would find them elsewhere where it's not me selling them, it's somebody else. And that, that being said, and if somebody wants to buy us a cup of coffee, uh, there's uh, paypal.me forward slash D-P-A-R-R-Y 777 for Reverend David. And for myself, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And uh, we appreciate the uh, people that have uh, availed themselves of, of buying us coffee. You know how much we love our coffee and our tea. And uh, I, I want to do a special shout out, though, to my, my friend in Central Asia, uh, Vadim, uh, who's just been very, very supportive of me uh, through this journey of, of now 41 episodes. And so I just wanted to say hi to him on the other side of the world. And uh, that being said, uh, and I, I believe in this, I did. I said that David's books, Reverend David's books are available on Amazon. And so there we go. That's our little episodic uh, presentation at the end of our uh, wonderful conversation. There's another wonderful conversation we have here. But if you could, uh, please, uh, if you have any sparks that you want to strike off the anvil of time, uh, please share those and then lead us in one of your wonderful prayers on this wonderful Mother's Day. <clears throat> um, just one thing, because it's my, my, my habit before we go. Um, back to the UFO stuff, I suppose. Um, I'm very interested in Jacques Vallée um, and some of the NASA people that wrote about the UFOs. 
Uh, what was it? Agents of Deception, uh, where basically one of them says nothing is happening here that wasn't happening during the medieval witch trials in Europe. That's interesting. And, you know, uh, yeah, there are demonic entities at work. I noticed the UFO community gets round that by calling them interdimensional as opposed to extraterrestrial. Hey, look, vocabulary. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a fraught area full of mysteries and skullduggery, but it's worthwhile maybe having a having a quick look. Um, Mother's Day. Oh, heavens. My friends in the days and weeks ahead, particularly maybe today, let's remember that we didn't really get here by ourselves we got here through the ministrations and the activities and the blessings and well wishes of others without mothers none of us would be here uh, mothers are a true blessing they can be very difficult but hey they're human and they're still a blessing because of our mothers we remember we learn how to take the first steps forward in our lives, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. We learn how to stand on our own two feet. And because of their example, hopefully, we learn how to dream of ascending to higher purposes, higher goals, and leading our own lives in our own way. And that's a great blessing. In the weeks, in the days ahead, in the weeks ahead, let's remember the lessons we were taught by those who loved us and learn to leap for everyone who we love, from false to true, to that state and realm of light, which is beckoning us all and is the parent of all and the source of all. May you be blessed in, the, in this day and this week and in these days ahead. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all so much for sharing this Mother's Day with us, and I look forward to seeing you soon.